Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to the 39th annual lecture series uh, that's co-sponsored uh, by the McLean Center for Clinical and Medical Ethics and by the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence. Uh, as you all know, uh, this year's um, lecture title is Ethics and the COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, medical, social, and political issues. It is the deepest and greatest honor uh, for me to welcome an old colleague and friend, uh, James J. Bradner, um, who is the president of the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. Uh, the home institute is in Boston, but it's an uh, institute that is around the world. Um, uh, Jay will talk today on the topic of an industrial strength response to COVID-19. Uh, let me just say a couple of quick words uh, about Jay. He, he joined Novartis uh, in November of 2016 and became president of the Novartis Institute of Biomedical Research in March of, uh, of 2016. So from between January and March, he's a member of the executive committee of Novartis internationally. Uh, prior to joining Novartis in 2016, um, Jay was on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School in the Department of Medical Oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute um, and had, had been from 2005 until 2015. Um, Jay is a co-founder um, of five biotechnology companies and has authored more than 250 scientific publications and has received 50 or more U.S. patent applications. Um, Jay Bradner is a graduate of Harvard University and of the University of Chicago Medical School. Um, I have to say a quick word that's not, not official, but um, for four years while in medical school, Jay and I played squash and three times he allowed me to win uh, in four years. So I, <laughs> I felt particularly proud. Uh, Jay completed his residency in medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and his fellowship in medical oncology and hematology at the Dana-Farber 
Cancer Institute. Uh, he's been honored uh, with many, many awards over the years, was elected into the American Society for Clinical Investigation in 2011, and the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society in 2013, to name just a few. So today's talk, as I said, is going to be, quote, an industrial strength response to COVID-19. I am so delighted to see Jay and to have him with us, Jay Bradley. Mark, thank you so much for your uh, kind in invitation and also the really uh, generous and hilarious introduction. Um, I assure the attendees of this conference that no consideration has ever been given to Mark on a squash court. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I hope that you can see my slide display mode, Mark. Is that correct? Yeah, beautiful. OK, thank you. Um, this was quite pretty to put together some reflections at this point in the global pandemic and how uh, large pharmaceutical companies and how our biopharmaceutical ecosystem has responded to the present pandemic. An interesting as I had not written a lecture on that subject, I really most hope that we can engage in a quite me more meaningful dialogue um, after this, uh, these slides are presented. Mark shared, um, I am uh, the head of research at the Swiss Novartis, headquartered in Basel, Switzerland. Our research headquarters are in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so I'm calling here from suburban Massachusetts, sub suburban Boston. Um, relevant disclosures for this academic interaction are on this slide. And I would only add um, two additional disclosures. First, I'm a chemist as well, and so I may show some chemical structures. I will not get too technical, I assure you, uh, not to disrespect technical experts on the call today, but recognizing that this is an interdisciplinary center I enjoyed attending seminars at uh, for many years in my time in Chicago. And my second disclosure um, is that I'm not an expert in bioethics, uh, clinical medical ethics, um, moral philosophy, um, but um, have tried at the end of this presentation to organize my own thoughts and those of my leadership team around what ethical circumstances tend to arise in biopharma, uniquely or not uniquely, and others that we've experienced and organized discussions around through the course of the pandemic. Those last two slides may be the most interesting slides to this, um, to this group. Um, well, I think it's most important just to calibrate where we are in the middle of this pandemic. All of this information is surely well known and following the Johns Hopkins dashboard almost weekly um, since it started in the spring of 2020. And the global burden of this is, um, is just impossible to estimate in the two. And the statistics are mounting and deeply, deeply concerning. And so um, it's hard to celebrate an industrial strength response to COVID-19 because we haven't cured this disease and because we have not as yet eradicated this disease and because the burden of this disease is still so challenging. Uh, for, for all the challenges we might face as individuals or as families, I'm just constantly reminded that there are others in truly impossible situations, elderly patients, uh, vulnerable patients, patients with inadequate access to first world vaccines and available therapeutics to manage the disease, challenges to healthcare workers, less so now uh, in the fully developed world than in low and middle income countries, um, and friends infected, um, some even going into intensive care, and then all of the intangibles on the economy, on employee, um, uh, children raised at this time of disruption and isolation. Um, I think that it's fair to say um, that we're still deeply in the weeds of this pandemic. And the data in uh, Illinois, in Michigan, and in certain countries in the world uh, remains deeply concerning. I'm relieved to hear that this spike is uh, mostly mapping to young individuals who might tolerate um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, this is less true in Michigan and, and surely not true in Brazil, where the death rate just continues to climb. And so it's hard to be too celebratory about um, some of the technology innovations that have to a sense of optimism or perhaps exit um, from this pandemic. 
um, there is light at the end of the tunnel where her is achievable as these updated data from this morning in Israel, um, there is a sense that we might even with emergent variants see an end to this pandemic. And so let there be that beacon of hope in Israel um, that there could be some exit vector for um, this um, historic event that we're living through. Now, the truth is we could have been better prepared. And uh, before I talk about the response that I've observed within our organization, where I can comment in some detail and in the community of biopharmaceutical leaders with whom I've engaged so closely the last 13 months and regulators and government officials. Um, but I wanted to first calibrate by saying we really could have been much better prepared. Um, it has been well appreciated now for over a decade, almost two, that the coronavirus family can um, transmit uh, from animal reservoirs into the human species. This was true with SARS-CoV or SARS in 2002, 2003 with evident epidemic local spread and MERS, which actually was a more lethal virus um, than SARS, albeit a little bit less infectious. And in the context of those two xenobio uh, um, uh, um, transmissions, zoonotic transmissions from animals into humans, um, a group of scientists and government leaders uh, were organized from the Institutes of Medicine. Quite painful to read this online book um, shown on the right um, from more than a decade ago that spells out all that would be needed to mount a um, immediate response to a pandemic. What science, what technologies, what targets would need medicines and what could we do to prepare for this? Um, as I was getting up to speed on the biology of the virus, as I'm a cancer doctor, I was quite new to this field of study last February, as the accounts from our Shanghai site started to trickle in and then uh, through the expansive access to information through the mainstream media. Um, I took a look at this book and it defines uh, the innovation of polymerase inhibitors and protease inhibitors and better diagnostics. And it's fair to say a very small community that had religion about coronavirus as a global public health threat um, took this charge seriously and thankfully built a strong foundation of research upon which some of the technologies I'll share in a moment and reflections on them more than that. Um, uh, but we were quite ill-prepared. The reason that there is a chance to get out of this pandemic with such expediency, fundamentally maps back to hulking innovation platforms that were built for other purposes, but that created a technologic pandemic preparedness um, in certain pockets of the biopharmaceutical industry. These are hulking and inventive technology investments like the massive bioreactors on the left that can scale up immunoglobulins or antibodies as therapeutics and I'll share some insights into vaccine. These are innovative technology platforms that are importantly built for scale, science at scale, because to address even a rare disease, as in some of the biotechs I was a part of starting several years ago, can require hundreds of scientists, 10 plus years, numerous trial and error experiments, ultimately to make a medicine that might be scaled for a small number of patients to imagine such a rapid response for a disease that could affect and did affect millions of patients is quite a bit more challenging. I borrowed the next few slides from a colleague and friend at Moderna, um, Stefan Bansell, their um, leader uh, here in the Cambridge ecosystem. And um, this is just to illustrate the scope of these hulking investments. The company Moderna was founded with the idea that if gene therapy is exciting to give DNA, sometimes with a virus, to add a gene back to the genome or to introduce a therapeutic gene that's been engineered, well, then maybe giving mRNA, which is the product of DNA transcription, remember DNA to RNA to protein, could be even more exciting. And so this company was started to imagine ways of administering new genes to patients for um, illnesses, more so than infectious illnesses. But it was learned along the way at Moderna, as in our own laboratories, that mRNA is very immunogenic. 
meaning when mRNA is injected into muscle, it's taken up by dendritic cells that present a protein made from that RNA to the immune system, eliciting a massive immunologic response. And we once had a DARPA contract to make antibodies for soldiers with mRNA, but the anti-drug antibodies were so high and tighter that we had to consider this more vaccine platform as Stefan and colleagues did at Moderna. And so this platform that was built, and this is, I believe, their Norwood manufacturing site, is, uh, has brought capacity to establish proof of concept for adaptive immunization to other viruses, programmable nucleic acid synthesis. Chemists like me might take a prototype and tinker with it once. Here, it could literally dial up the payload of interest, this spike protein payload, on a computer, um, inputting the genetics. But they also built preclinical models for clinical evaluation, um, a lipid nanoparticle chemistry that has a long legacy in our field, but optimized for the delivery of immunologic payloads. And drug like prop designed also to scale. Well, these might make for proof of concept medicines, but to make a real world patients around the world and healthy individuals around the world might take requires considerations of shelf life, storage temperature, safety, tolerability, potency, consistency of manufacture. And it's fair to say all of these technology investments were made without the knowledge they would become essential during a pandemic. And that's not the least of it. There's commercial and manufacturing considerations like low exit requirements and non-product dedicated plants, smaller footprints and supply chain networks. The idea that one could, once a medicine was innovated, studied to be effective, that it could be into multi-dose vials, that there could be then cartons and cases and pallets for distribution around the world with storage conditions that would be compatible with broad clinical use. Very little of this was invented on the fly. It was reconsidered or repurposed in the context of this pandemic. And it's fair to say Moderna didn't undertake this research alone. They have many experienced partners that they built for their RSV, cytomegalovirus, and other programs that were relationships that were very much in place to help respond to that pandemic. And I think that of these, I keep coming back to and understanding what might be in place for the next pandemic, the access and utility, the nimble repositioning of hulking technology platforms, as well as enhanced connectivity, collaborative models, working relationships established, new and facile, um, are, have proven essential to the pandemic response. Well, I could have told the same story in the context of the innovation of mRNA vaccines at BioNTech, more similar than different to the Moderna technology, and their partnership with Pfizer. Suffice it to say, as presented in the New England Journal, um, over the last few months, that the efficacy of these mRNA platforms now having completed phase three trials, in some cases with six or seven month follow-up, has proven quite remarkable, quite durable. Please know I have no conflict of interest to these vaccines. Um, like many of you, I await the arrival of these vaccines to have better penetration into our community here in Massachusetts. But I do find it incredible because if you had asked scientists as we um, did at our leadership team meetings to imagine what the efficacy of mRNA vaccines at this scale might be amidst an evolving pandemic with new variants, I think some of the most optimistic would have thought 70 or 80%. And so to see 90% efficacy durable in this way um, is quite remarkable. Um, in truth, the most thing about this pre-existing infrastructure to deploy in pandemic times is just how quickly the science has moved. Built again on a strong foundation I'll mention in a moment, the genome sequence of SARS-CoV only presented into the public domain in January of 2020, um, to the credit of those scientists in China in real time to the report of the clinical syndrome. And this led to in about 11 months, the invention, the preclinical testing, the regulatory path, and ultimately the clinical investigation of two highly efficacious mRNA vaccines. It's an unprecedented uh, record in time, a process that really takes 
between four and 10 years and is most typically unsuccessful in its first approach to viruses. All these years later, uh, we lack um, an efficacious vaccine, say to um, the HIV virus, despite intense consideration. Well, the vaccine space um, is not a story of Pfizer of Bio and BioNTech or of Moderna or Oxford, AstraZeneca or J&J, &J, these four authorized vaccine innovators and manufacturers. Um, it's actually a story of a large field of study that has converged down upon a very small number of highly credible and hopeful vaccines. And of course, not all of these have worked. This has required a consideration not just of a new platform like mRNA, but the repositioning of inactivated viral platforms, live attenuated viruses, DNA-based, not RNA-based, non-replicating and replicating vectors, as well as traditional proteins with immunoadjuvant small molecules um, or um, inorganics uh, built in. It's that COVID-19 commanded the full consideration, massive, global R&D infrastructure. The principal second reason why the response to the pandemic was so quick maps less to the biopharmaceutical industry than to the quite mature fields of science in many different allied disciplines of therapeutics. Um, the fundamentals of viruses is quite firmly established. The genome sequence of a new virus could be so quickly interpreted and understood. Shown here on this slide are um, a handful, but not all, of the uh, critical structural proteins that make the um, capsid and structure of the um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, as well as some of the non proteins, the machines that contribute to viral replication, infectivity, and ultimately a viral exit and further infectivity of virion expansion. Um, coronaviruses have been well characterized by a mature field of viral biology. They're typically innocuous, irritating, inconvenient, but can be and scary. They're in four subfamilies. They circulate in a massive animal reservoir, bats, livestock, other, as I mentioned, have seven times now jumped from animals to humans. It's an RNA genome as shown in red, one of the largest RNA genomes speaks to its outstanding proofreading activity of 30,000 bases. Um, now, many of these proteins might be considered for vaccines and others might be considered for therapeutic development. And perhaps most famous among all the proteins in orange is this spike protein. Here again, foundational science provided not only an understanding of the function of this protein to determine what hosts can be infected, humans and not mice, with this first emergent coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, um, but what cell types might be prone to infection as they would be bound by this uh, spring-loaded spike protein. Further functional studies from the NIH in particular had mapped the, the immunogenicity of this spike protein, um, describing it as an outstanding target uh, to consider for vaccine innovation, and even in Kizzy Corbett's group, had um, identified mutants that would build the immunogenicity um, of this protein. And those actual mutants map from SARS and into the SARS uh, uh, spike protein sequence overnight led to the innovation of the Moderna vaccine. The spike protein is also the target of uh, therapeutic antibodies, which I won't consider in this conversation today. You might think of the non-scientist or scientist, this spike protein is like a, a broccoli floret that has this outer leafy domain covered in these sugars. Um, and what this um, field of study has done is to give atomic resolution into the life cycle of the virus that has afforded opportunities for vaccine and therapeutic innovation. I won't go too deeply into this because I imagine much of this is already known, but I think of the life cycle of the coronavirus in sort of four fundamental stages. The first being viral entry, where the spike protein engages receptors, the ACE2 receptor, on the surface of a target cell, say an airway epithelial cell, and then is spring-loaded to open and release fusion machinery to um, 
uh, bind into the membrane of the target cell, creating a pore into which um, the viral genome uh, coded in protein is then injected. The second step is protein production and processing. This mRNA has two open reading frames and some structural proteins from which, like beads on a string, um, individual globular proteins are prepared. An essential protein that I'll talk about in some detail in a moment, so try to remember this, called the main protease, is one of these proteins on this um, string of pearls. And this protease functions to release itself, NSP5, and then clip off all of these beads to liberate these machines, driving further infectivity. The next important protein functionally, which is the target of this drug remdesivir, is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. With the protein fully synthesized, they form large molecular machines, as shown here, that can bind to an orange with some primer material, leading to a replication first of the um, uh, um, sense, strand, sense strand, and then this leads to amplifying the viral genome. So after infectivity, proteins are made, um, liberated to form machines that replicate the viral genome and then form virions that are packaged with that genome for release um, into the bloodstream, into adjacent tissues. And these so-called sense RNA um, in viral particles um, released through the ER Golgi um, intermediate compartment Exocytic, exocytic vesicle, um, like a bubble that goes to the surface and pops, liberating the virus around the body. I use over a couple of minutes the viral life cycle because I'll now make mention of some of these machines and how we and others have approached the invention of first therapeutics um, for SARS-CoV-2. Now, it's fair to say that the literature has proven not only an important foundation, uh, to understand SARS-CoV-2, but it still proves extremely directional. Uh, there are literally hundreds of manuscripts in just this last one year published on the subject of SARS-CoV-2 biology, reconsiderations of SARS and MERS as well. We have a full understanding of the virus, not just in isolation, but all of the emergent variants um, that are not rising. Variant viruses may emerge with infectivity, improved fitness, like a new branch of the family tree. Um, this variant B117 emerged even during down in Southeast England, leading to an increase in local cases. By the end of December, it was 60% of new cases with 23 mutations, more infectious, but thankfully not more lethal, and um, more so thankfully uh, responsive to many of these vaccines. And scientists are now very hard at work to understand each mutation structurally and functionally. This work is transpiring both in the academy as well as in biopharma with almost real time a publication of which I think is a great testament to um, the open access publication system today. Um, for drugs uh, like me and my colleagues at Nibber, uh, we need almost atomic resolution of these proteins because we are like molecular locksmiths that make small organic molecules that could be pills, maybe taken as a um, taken orally, that will fit into the little molecular keyholes in these proteins. And so we're always looking for a little pocket, as shown here in red on the protease trimer, um, in which we can position a small key to block say the function of this protease, preventing it from clipping other proteins and contributing to the viral biology. Um, there's a great um, conversation back and forth between the protein scientists called biochemists, eticists who are mapping and tracking these new variants. This works to ensure that as we innovate new medicines, that we're always working on the most threat um, to the human species. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our work at Nibber, but I, I thought first in fair balance, just to describe in a few slides, the massive global investment now in the consideration of therapeutics. I mentioned um, the large number of vaccines in development. It's a smaller number of antivirals, 
in a slightly more expansive number of non-antiviral medicines. These could be medicines to block the inflammation attributable um, coronavirus infection in an ICU. Um, but it's fair to say that out of the other end of this funnel, there is a very small number of effective medicines to treat established disease. Um, seen another way is the availability of vaccines and um, um, was very, very quick. And early antiviral study was really quick. Uh, but unfortunately, we have yet to realize highly efficacious antiviral therapeutics um, and none really that can be taken orally at scale around the world to treat medical communities um, and in earlier stages of disease, if not for prophylaxis. And so we believe that there is a real need for therapeutics, but I will say that it is a very small coalition of the willing working on direct acting coronavirus therapeutics. The first effort um, in the heat of the pandemic last March, uh, we organized with all of our drug molecules that are already um, prescribable today, FDA approved, with molecules that are clinically staged, so there is a human experience with them across the whole industry. And together with the Gates Foundation, um, we at Novartis and a couple of partner institutions set up a therapy accelerator where we would bring in all of these small molecule tools and study them in uh, miniaturized Petri dishes looking for activity in SARS-CoV-2. It's fair to say then, not in humans, but in tissue culture and Petri dishes, and in some cases in animal models, um, no stone was unturned uh, to look for the activity of medicines invented for a completely other purpose to be um, active against SARS-CoV-2. There were a number of important publications in this space. Um, and I do think it's possible that some of these medicines might read through to clinical activity, uh, but I would be surprised if any are as effective as bespoke invented antivirals. One story that I found particularly appealing is the discovery by Kayvon Shokat and colleagues that small target the BRD protein might block not so much um, viral proteins, but the human machinery required to amplify viral genomes. And this appealed to me because professor at Dana-Farber, as I last lectured when I visited the University of Chicago, we invented the first molecules to target um, the BRD4 protein um, called JQ1, shown here. JQ1 is a cyanodiazepine that binds to BRD4 and pulls it off the human genome. And what we discovered is using this molecule that BRD4 concentrates at certain regions of the genome as a master on switch to turn on genes. Some of these genes it turns on, we found, are involved in inflammation. Others are involved in fibrosis. And in animal models, molecules like JQ1 might block fibrosis, might block inflammation, might prevent death from sepsis, might block um, damage to the heart muscle. Um, and in a series of manuscripts with a lot of collaborators, we this over about a 10 year span. This site activated with that discovery and this now is not drug repurposing, it's the mechanistic repositioning. It's the understanding of the viral biology leads to a hypothesis about a mechanism and then molecules are used as tools in animal model systems, so-called preclinical models. And if they work, they might be advanced into clinical trials. And so this is all very early days. In at least two publications now, and a third I just read on BioArchive, this JQ1 molecule, which we've made you know, freely available to the community for research purposes, has been shown to decrease the expression of the receptor ACE2 that the spike protein binds to. And so maybe it's sort of like putting blinders on the cell. And then secondly, it decreases the expression of a protease that helps to activate um, viral entry. And seen on a protein Western blot, you can see this ACE2 in Shrul, uh, Arul Shanayan's laboratory. And just this week in Cell Press, um, a study of bromodomain inhibitors, including JQ1, was shown to pot potentially block the progression of, um, of cardiac disease, all in preclinical models. 
Uh, but I just show you the way that the scientific world has organized around mechanistic considerations built on the strong foundation of biology in this space. Just as John Charles Sorry and colleagues published in Cancer Discovery, a systematic review of all cancer medicines to ask the question, could cancer medicines maybe work uh, to treat COVID-19 as a clinical syndrome? And there are a couple of ideas that we and others were already deeply working on, like Janus kinase inhibitors that could block cytokine storms and inflammation, BTK inhibitors that might silence toll-like receptor signaling and B-cell activation and the like. Um, but there was no stone unturned in the mechanistic uh, repositioning of medicines. This happened not just on the host factors that I described, but has happened and is still happening on the viral proteins as well. You might know that the successful treatment of viruses can include direct acting antivirals, like the treatment of HIV, where as I said, there's no effective vaccine, but there is highly active antiretroviral therapy, small molecule therapy. In the case of HIV, just like in the case of hepatitis C, two targets that sort of bubble to the top of interest because they've given the biggest medical benefit are polymerase inhibitors, the protein machine that turns DNA into more RNA or DNA into RNA, depending on the virus, um, and protease inhibitors. And I've introduced the concept of both polymerase and protease inhibition already. Well, as the genome of SARS-CoV-2 is RNA, it has dependent polymerase. And molecules that tend to inhibit polymerases, which are nucleosides, were then studied against polymerase. And in fact, a number of them, none of which were invented for coronavirus, were shown to have some activity in petri dishes. And these were advanced into clinical trials. And as surely you know right now, the intravenous administered remdesivir, as shown here, which to the scientists looks a little bit like the ADP um, nucleoside, were shown um, to have a meaningful clinical benefit in this disease. Now, remdesivir is an overt activity on decreasing viral load, and so we and others believe that we can do a lot better than remdesivir, but this medicine is now approved in helping patients in particular vertical care settings. Could we imagine protease inhibitors from HIV or hepatitis C crossover activity for the coronavirus protease. And so a large number of those molecules were tested. Here's a molecule from local to Chicago Abbott Laboratories, now called Abvi, Kalitra with lopinavir and ritonavir, a combination medicine. And there was some weak activity of the SARS-CoV-2 protease and potentially even the Tempris-2 cellular protease. Unfortunately, the protease inhibitors read as coronavirus medicines have not shown as yet the efficacy of remdesivir. Um, but a new candidate from Pfizer has just completed the first part of a clinical trial by their own report. This intravenous medicine was made for human rhinovirus 14, which has a protease that is structurally similar to SARS-CoV-2's protease. And so we're hopeful that that might work. But beyond vaccines, the biggest contribution to coronavirus therapy came in clinical intuition and investigation. The use of high-dose steroids in people with profound lung disease led to the consideration globally, but as studied in the UK, of the steroid dexamethasone. Now, this isn't the muscle-building steroid, but an immune-suppressing steroid um, that has shown a dramatic improvement in invasive mechanical ventilation, in oxygen requirement, and overall mortality um, compared to best supportive care. And many other um, uh, potential were considered. You probably know the story of hydroxychloroquine. I'll only make the briefest mention of it here. But there was an early suggestion that the deacidification of lysosomes that are part of viral entry into the cell um, with hydroxychloroquine might work in COVID-19. And this received um, exhaustive consideration, regrettably not demonstrating consistent activity and possibly increased toxicity. There's been a huge amount of innovation beyond biopharma. I want to just acknowledge that um, there have been creative adaptive responses in so many industries to the present pandemic. I apologize to those innovators. I'm only going to talk about medicines here today. In this um, next section, I wanted to share with you a little bit of inside baseball about how did we, as a leadership team, um, responsible for a 
company that is um, significant in size, $220 billion market capitalization and 106 associates get organized internally um, to protect our associates and then um, get organized to contribute to this pandemic with our, our sleeves rolled up as part of the solution. Just a brief description of where I'm calling from. If you're not familiar with Novartis or Nibber, Novartis is similar to many pharmaceutical companies access to medicines with hundreds of approved products between our innovative medicines and our generics. But different than a lot of drug companies today, we still believe you have to invent your own medicine sometimes, that some drugs are so hard to realize that it takes a generational strategy, which is hard to execute in the biotech sector. And so about half of our medicines derive from internal drug hunting and half from partnering. And that makes us a little bit unique. We've got almost 6,000 um, uh, discovery scientists on Institute um, and 90 clinical stage molecules, clinical trials are more. And every year we devote about $9 billion to r and I'm not trying to impress you with scale because you can't beat coronavirus or cancer or Alzheimer's disease with muscle. It takes working nimbly in a really um, ingenious mindset to move from the concept of a drug to the proof of concept in phase two clinical trial. Now, we were a little bit hamstrung in this present pandemic because we sold our vaccines unit to GlaxoSmithKline. Um, in 2014, um, and we exited infectious diseases as an, a coordinated area of research in um, 2007. And so we weren't in a great place to contribute, and so we went deep on where we might matter. Um, and without a vaccines unit, we stood up a right away a drug discovery unit against the viral proteins themselves. And we did this at an institute within Nibber called the Novartis Institute for Tropical Diseases, uh, which is a small fraction of our project investment at Nibber, but is home to some of the most promising and two of the most advanced malarials in clinical study today, together again with the Gates Foundation. We have a long legacy of contribution in small molecule drug discovery, and that's probably our, our strongest area. And so uh, we put a huge investment into the coronavirus drug discovery with our chemists. But um, just for completeness, there are five types of therapies that we're interested in, like biotherapeutics. But it seemed that Regeneron and Veer and Eli Lilly and Molecular Partners had the biotherapeutics covered, and we wanted to make a contribution that would be in that way quite unique. Um, this is not at all intended for advertisement, just to share with you that um, for our internal research engine to exist, it has to be productive, especially in the commercial marketplace of today's pharmaceutical companies, where most companies have abdicated their responsibility for drug hunting. And probably 50% of our revenue, maybe 60% of the value in our late stage clinical trials are all internally invented molecules. We don't suffer from a not invented here syndrome. I just intend to show you um, that this group is, is highly productive and has made some really important medicines. So quite experienced. So I'm going to take you through these five threads of our industrial strength response to COVID-19 at Nibber. And first and foremost is associate safety. Um, it has felt like quite a, a real responsibility um, to the 106,000 global associates who um, work beyond research in manufacturing and finance and um, really all operational functions. And we kept our labs open throughout the whole pandemic. Um, and we took this decision not um, uh, quickly, um, but in the recognition that, um, that patients with cancer can't wait for a pandemic to be over. That patients with heart disease, the, still the number one killer globally, can't wait for a pandemic to be over. And we tried to, in March of last year, uh, make the research environment safe for our associates, but allow them, enable them, equip them um, to do safely around each other in their collaborative way, but with an intense degree of individual responsibility for sure, uh, but I think strong support from the organization as well. Um, now, knock on wood here, um, you know, we're a year into our um, essential research workers on site, and we have not yet experienced on site workplace transmission, although we have had um, a few cases of coronavirus from community exposure. And this has required um, real efforts from our associates on site, as well as many of our leaders 
um, to take contact tracing and isolation quite seriously. The second way we worked to respond to the pandemic was with access to medicines. Um, you know, even with remdesivir, the medicines that actually keep patients alive who are in ICUs, COVID-19, require sedatives and bacterial fighting medicines to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonias, and the injectables were in short supply. Now, wealthy countries like the United States might um, have access or even compete for access, but we were worried as a global company that cares a lot about drug access and has a generics company um, that we could work to ensure this. And so um, we identified the 15 essential and difficult to access medicines and provided them at a no profit basis to low and middle income countries um, uh, until that point where either curative therapies or available vaccines arise. Um, and this was one of our biggest, I think, contributions to this pandemic. We also um, have hydroxychloroquine as one of these genes. And there was a time last spring when hydroxychloroquine was even recommended for use by some medical systems. And we were uncomfortable that there wasn't basically a data set robustly supported. And though we would take no profit on hydroxychloroquine as a generic medicine, profit, we stood up a very expensive and well-designed phase three clinical trial in order to ultimately test this hypothesis. Um, hydroxychloroquine wasn't our idea. We didn't regard it as the very best idea, but there was an urgent to understand and explain um, uh, whether it could work in, in this disease. And so we set up a multi-center randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three clinical trial um, for hydroxychloroquine monotherapy and even with azithromycin, which was postulated by some to work. Thankfully, through the course of this trial that we set up and globalized in um, uh, record time for our own company, teaching us a lesson on how to translate investigation swiftly, um, it failed to recruit because the virus um, became uh, less a concern with vaccines, but also because questions arose. We gave a full reconsideration of our anti-immune medicines like interleukin-1 beta targeting canakinumab and JAK2 kinase targeting ruxolin. Could we block immune cytokine storm and set up large phase three clinical trials? Uh, regrettably, those two medicines didn't. Even back in our early pipeline, we took our leading novel anti-immune medicines, um, such as first-in-class inhibitors of the so-called inflammasome, testing more of a myeloid compartment and innate immunity and less um, adaptive T and B cell immunity. These clinical trials are ongoing. Uh, but we're so hopeful that they could help patients. And part of pandemic response wasn't coming up with our best ideas, but just listening to the community and responding to investigators at medical centers around the world for initiated trials. And in the time, more than 100 proposals were received, more than 30 trials were stood up overnight, um, and we worked with any number of organizations around the world. But the doomsday scenario is this virus changes or that this virus comes back, vaccines prove ineffective, and we can't be um, caught um, on our heels the next time. And so in our laboratories, we set up a program to target coronavirus uh, protease. And as I shared, this protease is an essential gene, and it's also a gene that does humans, suggesting that we might be able to make a medicine for it that would have strong efficacy and be very well tolerated. Now, why do we pick the protease? Like Moderna, with their mRNA vaccine platform, we had made um, big investments in creating a chemistry discovery platform that's called COVID proteomics. Normally, we make drugs by picking a protein, developing bioassays for it, introducing libraries of molecules in search of a point for drug discovery. And a lot of, actually most uh, medicines are discovered this way. We thought to just turn that on its head and just take a library of proteins that are very sticky, what we call electrophiles, and just throw them at the human proteome and say, what sticks to what? It'd be like mapping all of the footholds on El Capitan to then decide how to climb that face. We do this work in an open science strategy with uh, Dan Nomura and colleagues at the University of California, Berkeley. We've made now millions of molecules that are sticky in this way and have mapped thousands of novel protein starting points. It's exciting chemistry. 
These molecules tend to bind a single amino acid called cysteine. And we can map cysteines that are druggable in the human proteome. And so we wondered, does the coronavirus have any important cysteines? And it turns out that the main protease is able to clip other proteins and pull beads off the string using a cysteine active site. And so deep in this pocket, there's an amino acid on the protein called cysteine that's essential for the proteases. And so we started to map with our libraries of small molecules, do we have any starting points for drug discovery? These wouldn't be new drugs. They would be prototype drugs that we could then optimize with our you know, really sophisticated and experienced group of now more than 800 chemists. Um, and we found some outstanding starting points, some of which we've started to publish so that others can work on them too. Um, it's best not to do pandemic discovery research in isolation. And so um, in our case, we want this molecule not only to work against SARS-CoV-2, but also SARS and MERS. And we need to even imagine what a resistant uh, protease might look like and try to anticipate that with a new drug. And we're doing that in collaboration with the University of Massachusetts Computer Modeling. Um, this is going really well. We now have molecules that suppress viral load in preclinical models. Um, are very potent, low nanomolar to the scientists on the line, inhibitors of the protease. Um, but as an insurance policy against our own success or failure, we actually did something not done before. We've opened up the drug discovery platform to scientists from academia, like Stuart Schreiber at the Broad Institute, and even other pharmaceutical companies like Andy Plump at Takeda. Send us your molecules, we'll test them against and we'll send you the data back without even looking at the structures. Um, this is a new way of working that's like the rising tide. And we think that it has a chance to be applicable well beyond this pandemic to other severe and life-threatening disease spaces. This type of open science and public-private partnerships is something I became passionate about back with that JQ1 molecule. And I think is really underutilized in biopharma today. Through the pandemic, so many groups were self-assembling. Um, and um, we've enjoyed connectivity amongst leaders of R&D in the industry together almost every Wednesday night in the heat of the week, um, comparing notes on how to take best care of associates, how uh, but also to plan collaborative ways that we could interact, platform studies that we might under, um, interact with, uh, undertake together. And it's fair to say that um, third party groups did a lot to um, keep the dialogue moving and ready to the table with their best intentions. And I credit the FDA, the Hever Group, believe it or not, the Pharma Organization, as well as the NIH with its um, active program. And we've been um, contributors to the active program, which um, sought to bring medicines together for comparative study that might normally live in the isolation of individual clinical trials. And then lastly, um, contribution. We are a big global company, uh, but we work in um, communities. We have six communities where we do discovery research and um, from friends on the wards, uh, we learned about everything from needs for uh, viral nucleic acid purification kits to PPE, protective equipment for clinicians, um, as well as just concrete financial needs. We created a $20 million global fund for the communities in and around those spaces um, where, where we work and um, actually increase the investment ultimately reach even uh, larger global communities. We're um, not unique in this way. I'd like to think that many pharmaceutical and other industries have done similar things to try and help. Um, the most powerful ways is that we have a lot of clinicians still with medical licenses at Nibber, of one of whom here is Florencia Siegel. Uh, we train together at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. She remains on this disease faculty and like Florencia, uh, many, including myself, um, re-enlisted for emergency um, uh, management of the pandemic. Now, thankfully, the pandemic at the Brigham never got so severe that they needed a stem cell transplant physician from the pharmaceutical industry to hit the wards. And so I was not calling before, um, as, as well as several others. And um, her stories uh, from the wards were a source of energy, I think actually be supported uh, keeping these labs open and working on COVID. Perhaps we can talk about this in the Q&A. 
Um, I'm frequently asked these days, were there learnings about how to run a research institute, about keeping a large company safe, about new ways of doing business? Will you change your global um, real estate footprint? And Lainey and Mark shared that there are members of the, um, uh, the business school community here who might have um, uh, ideas, uh, I'd be all ears, or could have cu uh, curiosities about how we intend to come out of the pandemic once we're able to, uh, with a new way of doing business. And um, I've spent a lot of time here today talking about technology, the uh, request. Um, but if I've learned one thing in leading this breed, um, most productive and impactful, uh, biomedical private research institute in the world, these years is that this is not as much a molecules and atoms and dollars um, and indications um, business as it is a people business. And um, in this moment where we're quite actively recruiting uh, new leaders at every stage of the company, I'm just consistently reminded by this group, my leadership team, um, well, what a privilege it is to work around uh, people who are post-ego, uh, who are purpose-oriented, and who, um, you know, um, despite their perhaps lack of awareness of coronavirus biology or biochemistry, you know, really rolled up their sleeves um, through the pandemic to try and make a difference. Um, there are challenges, and I've listed a few of them here. You can surely read the slide for yourself. Um, we're lacking um, appropriate animal, model, animal models to test medicines that are rising. There are new variants that will infect mice that will be helpful to us, as we can't do monkey challenge studies, um, and we shouldn't do sino challenge studies with every rising medicine. Um, access to diagnostics and therapeutics is still a great challenge, and we still don't as yet fully understand risk beyond age and a handful of indications. I'm gonna finish where I ended. Um, I'm sorry, finish where I began um, with a little bit of a future outlook. We just simply don't know what to expect. There's a range of real possibilities. It's our responsibility in the present pandemic to be prepared for a doomsday scenario. The world is increasingly turning its attention to therapeutics with the availability of vaccines, um, and, you know, we might reflect on the um, influenza um, epidemiology following the 1918 swine flu epidemic as uh, reported by Fauci and colleagues back in 2009. Go back and read this article. 90 years later, we can still see traces of the 1918 flu genome in patients infected today with H1N1. Come on. And so I think we really do need to get organized around preparedness. Well, I slides to you, but um, as this is an ethics, um, I thought to share a couple of uh, reflections on the space of um, bio and ethics in biopharma and during pandemic times. And this is a quite a hot subject now. And so you can count on me, Mark and Lainey to tune in to future um, uh, of, um, uh, seminars in this series. I won't read this to you. But as we gathered with my leadership team um, to prepare for this lecture and to imagine um, what this community might have real expertise on, there are bioethical considerations that are so central to our function in biopharma that we've actually hired an ethicist from Harvard Medical School, Roberta Driscoll, to help us to assess the challenges as they arise, to connect to consult services extrinsic to our um, organization when uh, um, and to really start to build a framework for biopharmaceutical ethics. It sounds, I know, like an awkward term, um, but we have just an obligation to execute this important work in just the, uh, the most ethically appropriate way. I can imagine being in this audience today and hearing someone from a drug company talk about bioethics and you're rolling your eye. As I used to um, bristle when I would hear um, industrial scientists talk about patients. What do you know about the patient? I see the patient every day um, and how wrong I was. Um, there are really important business reasons that we should care about doing this work in an ethical manner. Our license to innovate and to provide medicines utterly depends on this. It's not only just the right thing to do, but it is of the associates that work with us who are oriented. Against these many, I think, established, but some interesting challenges like permanent agents, Lamy and Mark, and gene therapies, and it's like CAR-T therapies, and ambiguity of long-term follow-up, even 
as innocuous as mRNA, um, all the way through to issues of access and awareness and confidentiality um, connected to clinical investigation. But this is the last list I wanted to share with you, which I find really provocative. Um, the many ethical considerations that we either observed or experienced is pandemic times. Um, Patients and healthcare workers, and those needs will be better known to you than to me, and I'm certain your list will be longer for healthcare workers. But in Boston, we really struggled with helping um, give direction to our associates around managing personal and professional responsibilities, creating a much more inclusive uh, work environment than we had before, a much more adaptable uh, than we ever had before, catalyzed by the pandemic. Who is an essential worker in R&D? Is it because you love it? Or if you work on cancer, what about the stage of R&D? Are you essential if you're in the clinic or if you're doing discovery research? Or is it just supply chain researchers, supply chain workers who manufacture medicines as the Massachusetts state guidance um, suggested? How do we test associates? Can we mandate it? How do we provide vaccines? Can we access them? How will we return to work? And how will vaccination status influence that? Can bring people back to work where office-based workers fully vaccinated, or is it inappropriate to ask them? And not just in the United States, but in the 45 or more countries around the world where we, um, where we practice research and development. Animal model studies, the dialogue on them really changed. If you talk to our preclinical state uh, community, they will say that there is an appreciation now more than ever for the use of challenge studies in Sino because studies in humans was ethically untenable in many circumstances. And this narrative is quite evolving. On the flip side, it's notable that so many therapeutics were developed without animal model studies. As well, we've had some clinical trial ethical considerations. Can we do healthy volunteer studies of immunosuppressants, which are required by regulatory guidance, at a time when there's a circulating prevalent virus? The answer to that was no. Now, I'm not an expert in commercial considerations, but the pricing models that have been proposed and executed for vaccines and therapeutics, and that will evolve, I assure you, as the vaccines start to um, outstrip demand in their own supply, um, healthcare practitioner engagement, the appropriateness of those interactions, and so many more. In any event, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to visit today. I would say we're getting increasingly organized around ethics at Novartis. It's it's our core corporate strategy society. It is a business imperative. It's also the right thing to do and what our associates expect. And with that, I say thanks and would gladly stay and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. That was uh, an incredible science lesson and I love the ethics uh, part that you brought up. The, um, I, I wanna start with one science question by Dr. John Fung, who's the uh, head of our Transplant Institute here. He says, wonderful talk on the role of pharma in addressing COVID. Your approach to looking at the active enzymatic site of the protease is exciting. Has there been any evidence of mutations in these critical enzymes or has the mutations only been demonstrated in the spike protein? Thank you, great question, critical question. As yet, the naturally occurring um, uh, endemic viruses, um, Notably, those that are of the greatest global concern do not have meaningful mutations or even polymorphisms arising in the protease. And those that we have mapped, and we follow this um, very, very close to our Emeryville, California site, um, none of them map to the active site. So as yet, SARS-CoV-2, um, as we know it uh, today in this pandemic, um, should be uniformly sensitive to the medicines we're making. Now, with that said, um, one way to anticipate resistance is to do in vitro evolutionary studies. And uh, more and more of these are being done with medicines like remdesivir and resistance mutations to remdesivir have been functionally realized um, in laboratories. And that might predict for uh, resistance in the future. We are at the point now with our uh, lead optimization campaign where we can do selective pressure experiments to try to anticipate resistance with a series of protease inhibitors. It's unlikely to be only one. Um, so no prevalent mutations today, but we're working hard to discover them even in advance of their arising. That was the, the first was a research question. I'm, then I'm gonna hit a clinical question, which was asked by Martin Chan, who said, 
use of high dose corticosteroids in Hong Kong to treat SARS, the previous coronavirus, left many with a vascular necrosis. Is mm -hmm. its use justified this time? That's a great question. Well, I would typically call you and Mark to answer this question. So, Lainey, I welcome your opinions here. Um, I would say that the dexamethasone in this context is now well supported by properly controlled and blinded randomized studies. But beyond this demonstration of efficacy, of course, this issue of drug effectiveness. And for a medicine that's not, you know, a licensed medicine with evidence of a drug that we bring to the market for the first time, but an established medicine, a lot of times those post-marketing studies are not undertaken. And so I do believe, um, not only for the point that you raised, but about the extensibility, its utility to patient groups that who might have been ineligible for use in the context of a first clinical trial, perhaps they have immunocompromise or an active malignancy or any one of a number of exclusion criterion. I do think that a real world evidence at least understanding of dexamethasone is required to provide the doctors are used to a, a, a critical care um, management strategy. Great answer. Um, we have an anonymous attendee who asks, how do big farmers prevent their research from being stolen by foreign governments? Whoa, um, firewalls, I guess. Um, uh, I will say that we have a very organized um, uh, enterprise risk um, organization that um, uh, we have even updated risk management in R&D that thinks about everything from tornadoes and earthquakes to intellectual property loss. And, um, and we do have some safeguards uh, to prevent or at least to um, diagnose the migration, the inappropriate migration of data. Um, I will say I'm not kept up at night with the fear of foreign governments stealing our trade secrets. Um, we have, um, uh, but, um, but I do think we're pretty organized around knowing where our you know, crown jewel data sets are and uh, migrate to. Well, you, you, you pushed me there. So what does keep you up at night? Um, <laughs> but, uh, say, uh, um, wow. I think um, understanding disease biology, I think that when we know, hey, it's KRAS, it might take us a couple decades, but we're going to make a KRAS inhibitor. But there are so many things where we don't know because there hasn't been a genetic lamppost to look under. Um, Alzheimer's, what's the cause of Sjogren's syndrome? What's the cause of lupus? Uh, we don't know. And so just the atomic resolution of disease. And, and maybe the second one is... Um, is talent is, um, I do believe this is a people business. And in Cambridge here, you know, there's unprecedented biotech company growth and people are, I don't know, having great scientific experiences and making a lot of money before humans even lived a day longer. And those are the companies that pull our talent uh, from Nibber to, uh, into leaders. And so I just am constantly thinking, how do we make this the most exciting place to contribute your career to finding science? Um, those are the two. Beautiful answer. I now have two ethics questions. The first is from one of our current fellows, Esther Berkowitz. She wrote, I'm aware of a few pharma companies that have formal ethics committees, but it doesn't seem to have permeated industry as a routine phenomenon. Do you see a role for formal ethics committees that meet regularly within pharma and medical device companies? I do. I do. And I think with Roberta and Ezzy Garfinkel and Klaus Moosmeyer um, and, and many other of artists, we... Um, are I think increasingly pretty organized around this. Um, Nibber doesn't have a chief medical officer, but um, the head of our translational medicine, our clinical trials group for um, the non-malignant diseases called Evan Beckman. And Evan has just a, a personal interest in the ethical conduct of research, mapping back to um, his days. I share that with him, having a little bit of time with all of you at U of C. And um, really because we had an internal champion with legitimate curiosity, we started to get more organized around um, you know, research ethics. Um, I will say it doesn't arise every time, but when I put out the call for some ethical considerations that I might share with all of you, I do that a lot with new technology ideas, things I've read, articles I've read, and usually it's radio silence. I got back 40 emails in like five minutes. So I think that there is probably at companies like ours 
um, a legitimate and pent up interest to talk about these issues, to triangulate them and to provide better guidance to parent organizations. In our case, grad CEO, Vasnara Simon. Vas is a clinician scientist, global public health uh, leader um, in H1N1 vaccine response. And um, he just happens to be like a really moralistic and I think balanced and ethically minded guy. And so under um, Voss's leadership these last three years, we now have um, Klaus on our executive committee. We have a, uh, an ethicist in chief um, who manages also you know, risk management. Uh, now Novartis, like many pharmaceutical companies has had some um, tough experiences in data integrity with a business that we acquired uh, with um, sales practices that were either regrettable or perceived enough to be regrettable to prompt serious um, compensatory. And so we have really a, a, an imperative to get this right, to rebuild trust with society in the industry, but in our company especially. Wow. Uh, we have uh, an anonymous attendee who wanted to ask about, do you think pharma companies have an ethical obligation to ensure their products are distributed in equitable ways, both domestically and abroad? Yes, I do. And more importantly, um, our commercial leaders do. And so um, the narrative at Novartis is always drug access, drug access, drug access. We operate in Sub-Saharan Africa. We um, have a member of our executive committee um, who ensures that the discussions always culminate to a, a global health conclusion. And we've even made, um, I think, some pretty bold public statements, our CEO, around ensuring drug access. Um, in R&D, uh, this is a great challenge. For example, um, I have um, an idea about how you might cure sickle cell disease by taking hematopoietic stem cells, by introducing permeable genome editing machinery, turning off, uh, editing out the switches that keep fetal hemoglobin off, turning it back on, and doing a bone marrow transplant to get the cells back in. That's a mouthful. And even as a data transplant doctor, that's a complicated procedure. Um, even at University of Chicago or Harvard. And so how are we going to do that in Ghana? And so built around this idea of um, access to medicines, uh, Jonathan uh, Spector and I, this goes back now five years. So right when I arrived, we wrote a 10-year strat plan because we knew we were going to make this cure, but we knew that things had to be in place ultimately for it to read through to patients around the world. And that's the amazing thing about working at a, a big a global company is this five page document triggered unbelievable institutional responses. A fast forward three or four years, and we were working with companies with drones dropping hydroxyurea to medical centers that can try to use small molecule therapy, building clinical trial networks so that the infrastructure is in place to ultimately bring sickle cell diseases um, into the environment. Again, medicines first for those who need them most. And then we get to pricing. And um, our pricing strategy, which I'm, I'm not the expert on, has always the narrative, um, as I have a front row seat for those discussions on the executive committee, about value basis. There has to be a value basis. And it's a dialogue. We don't set the price. It's a dialogue with payers. And so if we go in with an access mindset, and if we're disciplined to follow you a value basis for, um, uh, for payment for medicines, be a path for most medicines to reach the patients in need. One of the challenges that we found though, medicines aren't approved for world use. They're often approved by the United States regulators first, and then perhaps the European regulators, and then perhaps the other countries. And there's this pregnant pause, as we learned with our spinal muscular atrophy gene therapy, uh, Zolgensma, where the US has it approved, where we're ramping up global supply and where overnight, every parent knows that their infant needs this medicine. And so I won't say we have it all figured out and that there have been some really tough learnings along the way, um, but, uh, but ours is a company that's built around um, value-based pricing and drug access and hold us to that account. Teresa Williamson is a, another current fellow and she asks, you mentioned unprecedented collaboration and sharing of scientific information to help patients. How do we continue to incentivize this behavior outside of the pandemic? 
the ultimate way to incentivize behavior in the private financial incentive. So I think I think about this a lot, right? Because I, I, I'm really closely with the Gates Foundation. And when Sue Desmond Hellman was leading, she had this really memorable um, statement. And we were having a coffee one day and she said, uh, you know, we were talking about what projects we might do and the budget that I have available to do corporate social responsibility and tropical diseases. And she said to me, she's like, let me challenge you. She's like, I'm going to, I'm going to miss uh, paraphrase her, but she said, the part of your budget that I want to access is not the corporate responsibility budget. It's the profit motive budget. That was really insightful. And so I think that um, we can, for um, certain types of projects, very seamlessly build public-private partnerships, pre-competitive work. And we've been really good at that. What was interesting about the pandemic is there was a sense, given how ill people get, the global economies, the individual toll, the death of young people, there was recognition that these could be profitable medicines. And what's interesting to me about the pandemic is that the narrative in all of these meetings where it's just R&D pharma executives on the phone, their narrative was always about access. It was always about equitable access. It was about having diversity on clinical trials so that people could believe the data. Um, you know, the, the closed room narrative was always sort of on the high road. And so I find that like the door getting cracked open a little bit because Here's a case where it wasn't corporate social responsibility. Everybody wanted to do the right thing. Everyone wanted to improve the reputation of pharma, but those aren't big enough drivers to command the investment of a $250 million phase three clinical trial. So if there's a way to incentivize cooperative behaviors, early disclosures, um, I think you see a real response from the industry. Look like the government voucher system for the diseases. There are diseases that we do clinical trials on, uh, not because we want to get a voucher, but we can justify a trade-off discussion for another investment because the voucher exists. And um, it doesn't have to be only governments that um, trigger these sorts of um, incentives. But to really put into perspective um, your question, there are more people right now working on COVID-19 than are working on antimicrobial resistance which you know, over a 10 year span is probably a bigger public health crisis. And I'll bet you a year from now, there's less than a 10th of number of people working on COVID-19. And so how do we convert this from a passing fancy to a sustainable um, incentivized um, uh, R&D community? Yeah. And I don't have an answer to that, but I'd be- oh, But your comments, I mean, your comments were, which were very powerful was about what's an essential worker and is it the person who's doing the cancer research? Because, well, we've had over, over 500,000 deaths here in the US from COVID alone. We also know that we've had an increased death rate for many other conditions because of lack of access to care and because we converted our um, surgical wards into uh, you know, COVID units and things of that sort. I'm gonna give the last word to the second generation. So Richard Siegler asks, Jay, Thank you for your talk today. You have probably seen from the Gates Foundation's 2020 Goalkeepers Report that many average primary health outcomes in low to middle income countries rolled back to circa 1995 levels last year. With the rise of malarial deaths, this included, could you speak to your partnership status on a malaria vaccine that will address some of the broader global impact of COVID-19? Thanks, Richard. And uh, great to almost see you here. I miss our time together. Um, so um, we have part of um, the Gates Foundation on um, anti-malarial small molecule medicine it is the bulk of our work together. Um, this is a like-minded group that we've worked with for more than a decade now. And KAE and KAF, these two medicines in phase three clinical study in malaria treatment and prevention prophylaxis are from our labs with cryptosporidiosis and dengue virus. Um, the thinking here is that we could cut a check, but then who spends the money to make a medicine? Why don't we just make it and then give the world a medicine? And, um, and that's been our strategy. Malaria vaccines are a very exciting area of study. I think that mRNA starts to emerge as a pretty interesting platform for malaria vaccines. But as we're no longer as focused in the vaccine innovation 
that our work with Gates is principally around um, um, uh, um, neglected tropical diseases. Said, we recently announced with the Gates a partnership um, to do a kind of science I would regard as like just science fiction in sickle cell disease. What if we can't figure out a way, even with this decade long strategy to do a genetically engineered, you know, bone marrow transplant in Africa, that might not work. And so um, together with the gate, a very open, um, very engaging and forward thinking uh, scientific partnership that we just announced to try to imagine, you, you surely know Richard, but others might not. There's this idea of um, one dose radical cure in so what would one dose radical cure for sickle cell look like? We're hard at work with them on that. Um, they've been a great partner. But in malaria vaccines, we, we innately have less work going on. Well, I want to say thank you. This has been a fascinating talk. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Mark to say the last words. We're going to stop now because the uh, fellows are going to be meeting with you. And thank you again for agreeing to meet with them at 1.30. And I just want to give everyone nine minutes to stretch bio break and come back to meet with you at 1.30. Mark, you have your last words. Last words are very few. It was an extraordinary talk, Jay. Um, um, and I, I was deeply moved by it. Um, I, I had one question myself, and that was going back near the beginning of your um, talk on the achievement within 11 months of reaching four sets of potential Vaccines um, that, that that could change um, that, that could change the the COVID nineteen um, uh, impact on the world, um, and that no one had ever done anything quite that quickly uh, by a factor of eight or ten times. Um, will that be? Will that somehow be a model to go forward with? as we work on other areas or or was it just on this one time that that, that it took place well thanks mark i think that for the space of vaccine innovation has been it's just changed and the path forward now for these validated platforms like mr the path from concept to proof of concept to phase 3 is a timeline that shouldn't be anymore as short as it was and if there were two dominant mRNA vaccine players, there's a third back and there'll be probably 20 by this time next year because the lagging strand of innovation in pharma really, really fast. It's a, an established business model. And so I do believe that the space of vaccines is forever changed. We're looking very hard for faster paths for small molecule delivery. It is another artisanal process. Um, I believe that once we get to phase one clinical investigation and trial designs that allow us to move um, efficiently and seamlessly arm in arm with regulators and investigators and patients from phase one to phase two B um, can take 18 months off of traditional timelines. Um, but you know me well enough to know if there's a faster or cheaper way to do drug discovery, I'm in. <laughs> um, it's just a little harder in small molecule um, therapeutics. Thank you so much for the talk. It was extraordinary. Okay. We'll, we'll see you in a few minutes again. Thanks, Guy. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Lenny. Fantastic.